All right, and I will share my screen real quick. All right, so here's my presentation. So thank you again for putting this together. Um, so like I said, my name is Chris Walters. I'm the grants manager and gallery curator for the Arts Council of the Southern Finger Lakes. I'm gonna be talking about these 2025 grant programs we're doing, um, focusing mainly on the ones the libraries have been a part of. Um, and I can email this presentation to it to, to pass along. So um, whatever questions you have, but just a couple of big, a little bit background about the Arts Council and myself. Um, so we're located in Corning, but we work in Cattaraga, Chemung, Steuben, Schuyler, and Tioga counties, um, particularly with our grant programs. And then we also do a number of other services. We have a folk art, folk um, arts coordinator that works um, on folk art programmings. We have a gallery, a lot of the other programs and services for artists and a lot of advocacy stuff. And we've been doing these particular grant programs for over 40 years. Um, I've managed these for, um, for over 10 years now. Um, I also run the gallery. I'm also a photographer. Um, part of my job is really like trying to keep things as simple as possible for people because I know a lot of, especially libraries, you have, you know, whether you have small numbers of staff or you have a lot of volunteers and trying to give, make this process as simple as possible for people. Um, I give a lot of detailed feedback to people, a lot of constructive feedback, honest feedback about applications. Um, I can talk more about that a little bit later. I, I sorry, this is not true. We are, our office is done with renovations. <laughs> I, I I have like four different PowerPoints that I keep going through for this this year, and I keep forgetting which one is the correct one. So this is a hybrid updated one. <laughs> um, our office is is open, but so email and phone call are are, are fine ways to get in touch with me. Um, so these particular grant programs. So this is these are funded by the New York State Council on the Arts. Um, through their big statewide community um, re-grant program. And there's three grants, uh, the Community Arts, Individual Artists, and Teaching Artists Grant. I'll briefly touch on the Individual Artist Grant, but it's really the community arts um, that most libraries apply for. And then also they've, they've hosted teaching artist grants as well. Um, again, these are for Cattaraugus, Steubens, Schuyler, Chemung, and Tioga counties. Um, big thing to remember, these are for 2025. So any programs and funding are going to be spent in the calendar year 2025. Um, and then they're also for the county where someone's located. And um, you're allowed up to three total requests, no more than $5,000. So I quickly will add to that. Um, so this is kind of our first round of funding. So we will have a second round that we do. And those applications are going to be um, a lot of launch in the spring. And then the applications for those will probably be due in May. Um, but so those will actually will bridge the ca calendar year. So those will be for the second half of 2025, first half of 2026. Um, but the reason I bring that up is because it's a $5,000 total allowed amount between the two rounds, because it's all part of the same funding funding year. Um, so for instance, if you applied for a program now for $3,000, you could apply again for $2,000 in the spring round. And a lot of people will do that. Um, so the big one I'll talk about um, is the community arts grant. So this is the one that I, I would say um, the vast majority of all libraries that apply for the grants funding will, will apply for this one. So this one is really about doing any kind of community focus, arts, cultural activities um, in service to the community, in service to the public, in service to the people that come to your libraries, live in your towns. Um, they're for nonprofits, organizations, towns. Um, these grants are up to $5,000. So they can, they can fund pretty much anything directly related to the actual project. Um, there's very few things that can't be funded. One of those is hospitality, unless food is somehow an intricate part of, of the design of the program or built into it. Um, really receptions, food, things like that aren't funded, but most everything else is. Um, so it pays for artist fees, marketing, I can pay for the administrative time the library needs to put on the program. If people want to put that in their budget, it's, it really can cover anything directly related to putting on these extra programs. And the big thing is they need to be accessible to the public. So for community arts grants, yeah, you can still set a cap on the number of people. You can have wait lists, things like that. But you need to at least advertise and welcome it to the general public. It can be targeted towards certain, certain groups or certain ages, things like that. But in general, it needs to be open to, to anyone within that particular, you know, target audience that, that wants to do it um, within the limits of, well, we, we have a small classroom size or this particular activity we want to do only can have 10 people, things like that. Um, but it's really meant to open to the public. Each of these grant programs is going to have criteria and priorities. They're roughly the same, slightly mixed for, for a couple, but, but more or less, these are the big criteria. So we're looking at their artistic cultural merit, um, the benefit to the community and accessibility of the program, 
and then the managerial fan, um, fiscal competence. And then we also have priorities. So the criteria each are each awarded five points. Uh, and then the priorities are each awarded four points. So products that pay artists and then um, either BIPOC or LGBTQIA and or folk or traditional applicants and or focus projects or audiences, because maybe maybe the library itself um, isn't necessarily um, part of this particular group, but it's reaching that particular audience or, they bring, or they're bringing in an artist or program that speaks to that, um, these particular areas. So those are the priorities. And again, I, they're, they're roughly the same for each of the grants. Um, in terms of eligibility, uh, so nonprofit unit of local government, I think most all the libraries have separate nonprofit status in STLS. I know that Shimon County Library District is a separate case where the there is one nonprofit status for about four different libraries. Um, I don't know if anyone is from any of those libraries on this call, but but just for the information for those libraries, and, and they've started to do this, is that if there is a separate nonprofit that's associated with the libraries, like a Friends of the Library or an Advocate nonprofit, which I know, um, like I know Steel has one, I know there's one for the Big Flats Library, so they can actually apply on behalf of the libraries. So there's ways that some of these other libraries can get access to this, even if there's like one nonprofit status. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not incorporated, um, there is, you can go through um, either a fiscal sponsor, or community partner, so pretty much anyone that's a nonprofit, so whether that's SDL themselves, another library, uh, someone just in the same county that you're in. And then we have a whole list of kind of um, guidelines on our website, talk about eligibility, things like that. But generally speaking, most libraries are eligible for these programs. And if for some reason you don't have incorporation, just reach out to me and I can, I can help you figure out um, mechanisms to get your applications eligible. Uh, the teaching artist grant. So this is one that some libraries have done in the past. So this is really, uh, it's about supporting sequential arts education projects by an individual artist or an organization. Um, these are also up to $5,000, also can pay for most anything directly related to it. It's about enhancing, not um, taking away curriculum. Uh, there is demonstrated learning outcomes and evaluations as part of this. So the big thing with these is that it's, it's either in school, um, taking place during the school day, or it's after school, taking place at a school or community center. Community center, we do not define, but in most cases, it's there could be an official community center, children's center, or the library is considered a community center. So it's really very loosely defined. So this is where it's unique is that it's only for K through 12 students and it's something that doesn't have to be for um, open to the public. So say you had a specific group of K through 12 students that were really interested in a particular kind of art form, you could do a product just for those students. It has to be sequen sequential. Uh, it has to be um, kind of built around the same lessons and um, again, the, the criteria priorities are roughly the same. So I'll repeat those again. Uh, and the way it's kind of designed is that um, there needs to be a minimum of three sessions with the same teaching artist and the same group of students. Uh, for example, um, maybe two or three years ago, the library out, and I always mispronounce whether it's Appalachian or Appalachian, but that library out there, uh, they had hosted some teaching artists that worked with a group of, I think it honestly was about five students. And they did a whole um, thing leading up to a ballet and they did a whole costume design. So they, they did just different sessions on these are the theories of what you're doing for costumes. These are actually like the, the design part and then, they, and then they actually made costumes. So it was a whole long series of from, from start to finish. And then the costumes that were created were actually used in this ballet production. So that's an example of something someone did one time. Um, but it's really if you, if you end up having kind of a group that's they're really keyed in on some kind of particular thing and and you know you can get this going. It's so it's not. It's again, if you if you have this small closed group you're interested in, um, but if you're interested in doing it as a library, same library would be the applicant. You can hire a teaching artist. Um, teaching artist can also be an applicant. So if for some reason, say you want to do the community arts grant for your own projects, and then you have a teaching artist that's interested in doing something, they can be the applicant. So you kind of can can maximize the amount of money and, and programs you could do. Uh, this one, if people want to do work with a school, uh, they just have to have a kind of a letter of partner or a letter of commitment from the school. And um, more stuff is on our, our uh, website in terms of eligibility. And then the, the final grant, which I'll, I'll talk just incredibly briefly because I know everyone's from libraries here. But in case you do have artists that you work with or people that are always talking about, oh, I wish I had money to create my artwork or something. So this is the grant for them. So this is the individual artist grant. And the, the core of this grant is that 
it is to support the creation of new work by an individual artist. So the grants are up to $3,000 and it can pay for an artist's time, um, their, their materials, anything related to their work doing. And the, the artwork itself, um, there is a public engagement component to this grant. So either they engage the public when they're creating the work or through a public program. So um, a good example for this is say someone wants to create a mural. So they could, they can either, um, you know, have the, have the public be a part of that process, whether it's in creating the mural or designing it, or they don't want to have the public engaged at all. And they just want to put the mural on the side of a building. Um, so that's the, the, where it's going to be actually made in front of the public. So, so this is more for, um, but you might have staff members that are individual artists or other people that come to your library. So definitely something to, to pass along that information. This one again is similar criteria and priorities. Um, as the other ones, uh, this one, you do have to be 19 years or older. You can't be a currently enrolled student. Uh, people can work on things with another artist. And then the big thing is that it, it does need to be new and created specifically for the particular grant program. So that's that's the individual artist grant that we have. Um, the deadline for all these grants is Friday, December 13th, 2024 at 11.59 p.m., and it is an online application system, so it will shut off on you if you are in the middle of it. So I would not not wait until then to submit. I, I've, it's surprising or not surprising, we'll definitely have some timestamps that are wow. That is that's that's keeping it close. Um, but I would not recommend waiting until then. But uh, it's a it's an online system we use called Submittable. So if you've never used Submittable, it's a pretty easy system to use. It's very easy to uh, upload documents, fill out, you can save and return to it at any time. If you're a prior user on Submittable, whether through library or some other thing, you can use the same information you want. It's really up to kind of the organization if they want to have a historical access to their past applications, things like that. But it really doesn't matter from my end. In terms of the application parts, so you see the whole application once you log on to the, to the um, application portal. So you'll see there's kind of a section for the applicant information about who's applying, information about the project, and then the budget information. And the application is kind of comprised of there's some short narratives. Uh, if there is a letter of partnerships that's required, there, there's a place for that, and the work samples. The There are about five to six short narrative questions. The narratives are what going to provide the details to the grant panelists that's going to help them make their decisions. And I try as best as possible to make sure that each narrative is directly correlated to the specific criteria and priorities that the, the grant panelists are going to be scoring. There is no budget form. So if you're looking for the budget form and confused where it is, it's not there because it doesn't exist. Um, we got rid of the budget form a couple of years ago. So the, all there is, is there is a budget narrative. And in that section, you, would, you still have to um, detail out, I'm going to spend the grant funding on this for, you know, and for example, someone's, they say you're going to do a bunch of workshops. So the works, we're going to do three workshops. We're paying the teaching artists this number of dollars for this number of hours, things like that. So you do have to detail how you're spending it, um, but we do not have a separate budget form anymore. That was always the bane of everybody's existence and always mess ups or things happening. And so we got rid of the budget form itself. Uh, in terms of narrative writing and sort of writing tips, I think these are kind of applicable to this application, but really any kind of grant programs, is um, definitely make sure you're really paying attention to whatever the question that's asked and they answer it, not not what you think the panelists want to know or what you think, oh, maybe they mean this. Like it's wait, try to hone it pretty well to what what we're looking for, what the panelists are looking for. Um, and that said, be as specific and concise when you're writing your your answers. Um, try to avoid redundancies. I mean, be pretty ruthless with your writing in terms of going through and editing yourself. Um, and, and, and again, being specific and concise. So again, any kind of details and things that can flesh out the applications and make it clear that you've kind of thought through things. So if you're going to have a bunch of workshops. We're going to have three workshops. This is the audience. They're going to be free. These are the number of people that we can have in each workshop. Any of those kind of details um, are going to be really important. Uh, I tell people to use consistent language. Um, a lot of times someone might call a workshop some in one paragraph, the next paragraph they could call it a class. Next paragraph, they could call it a lesson. It tends to confuse panelists and confusing them in terms of what you're actually referencing. So when possible, really make sure you kind of use the same language throughout. Uh, and it also kind of speaks to not just your um, your specific language in terms of that, but 
telling the same story throughout your application. So for instance, if, if in your budget narrative section, you're talking about five workshops, but then in the actual narrative before that, you only mentioned four workshops, that's going to cause confusion. What's the actual dollar amount that you're requesting? Why is that? Where's the fifth workshop? So things like that. So it's really important to just kind of go through your whole application and making sure that you're kind of telling the same consistent story throughout. And then uh, there's no need to go to your thesaurus for these applications. Simple is better. Straightforward is better. You don't need to figure out some fancy grant language or things to speak to impress the panel. It's really about the straightforward. What are you asking money for? Why? What is it for? Things like that. Uh, definitely support your statements. And, and usually what I mean by that is if you're writing something that, oh, our, our community has always wanted to have a basket weaving class. How do you know that? Is it because the basket weaving classes always sell out because you always have wait lists? Um, you know, things like that. Whatever, just, you know, I, I tell people to stay away from using hyperbole if possible. But if you are prone to wanting to have some nice big statements and bold statements, just make sure you back them up. Uh, definitely write with a lot of confidence, a lot of active words, action words, things like that. Um, definitely write as if the grant panelists don't know you. We do, and I'll talk about this in a little bit in terms of where our grant panelists come from, but there's a chance they might not know you. They might not know your library. They might not know the circumstances in your community, um, the role the library has in your community, who comes to your library, um, things like that, why it's important this particular art form or performance or whatever you want to do is coming to your library. So really kind of think through it from a perspective of someone that might not know who you are, um, because whatever's in the application is what they're going to see. Yes, you'll provide a website link. Panels might look at that, but it's really whatever is in that application is, is the important stuff to convey. Uh, definitely focus on the quality of the programming versus the quantity. So a couple of years back, uh, it was right around COVID and then it's continued, which I'm very happy about, that there, the grant panels cannot take into consideration the the quantity of a program so what i mean by that is like if you're if your project is going to reach 10 people versus 100 people they can't factor that in they're only focusing on really the quality of what you're doing so whether a workshop is designed for five people or the workshop's designed for 20 people each one will be weighted the same um, there is a questions in the application that i have to ask those those details about how many people students it'll reach that's purely because I have to provide those those um, numbers to NISCA in my reporting. And whether someone gets grant funding or not, I have to put in all those all the numbers for anyone that applies. But the grant panelists, they whenever if they look at something, I'll be like, nope, you can't consider this. It's really about the quality of a project. Um, and then also make sure you get some kind of outside opinion on your application. So part of my job, I can look at draft applications, um, but get someone else that's look, to look at it to kind of make sure that what you want to have in your program is making sense um, outside of something that you may be accidentally filling in, things you think are on the paper that aren't. Um, so work samples. So the applications we have, so there is a requirement to have some kind of work samples. So these are really about supporting an application, not to hurt it. They're, you're demonstrating the ability to do a project, um, make very specific to the project is what I tell people. A lot of times libraries might hire an artist that they might have like five or six different things that they do. That's great. But in terms of your actual project, if you're hiring someone to do a watercolor class, but they also do book binding, they also do fabric, like all kinds of other stuff, like make sure you're showing examples of their watercolor work or their teaching experience. So again, it's, it's important to kind of showcase stuff that's specific to your funding request. Uh, if you do include links to their websites, um, whether it's someone's artist page or whether it's sexual music or performances or things that are on Vimeo or YouTube or some other place, just make sure those, uh, those streaming links are, are staying active throughout the duration of, of when you include them for the, for the application. So these are just some photos you can include for workshop examples. So this is demonstrating a class that's taking place or a workshop. Um, this is in a library. So again, giving context to what it's going to look like. Maybe you have a space that you want to give the, the grant panelists a, an image of where something's going to take place. You can include those kind of things. It is sometimes hard to convey like an artist actually doing something. But, you know, if you have some old photos of, of workshops that you've had or anything that can speak to just the caliber of, of, again, why you've chosen a particular artist for their particular project. Um, you know, if there's concert photos, things like that. Again, if you have artwork examples that you can provide from, from what an artist has done. Um, if you are providing any kind of links, uh, 
outside. So the easiest thing to do is create a Word document or whatever document program you use, um, type up all the descriptions, put the link in there, and then save it as a PDF, and then just upload that into the work sample section. So that's the best way to do it. You can put in um, video and audio files into the application system. I usually recommend people don't do this simply because one, they take up a lot of space. Two, they, they tend to be sometimes a little funny with platforms. So it may play great on your computer. It might not play great on another person's computer or phone or something like that. So the simplest, easiest way is to just put a, put a link somewhere uh, if it's going to be some kind of streaming streaming a song or performance or something like that. But if you're, if you're an artist, I know sometimes it's very hard to get artist samples from people. So you can also, here's the link to their website that, that shows their portfolio or something like that. So people will do that as well. Um, Cause I know, I know I'm an artist, artists are horrible about getting back to you. So it can be like pulling teeth sometimes. So if you need to put something like that in, that's fine as well. Or if you need to take screenshots from their website, you know, whatever, whatever you need to do is fine. So the way this review process works, so this is a really important component of these grants. So these grants are really, they're about bringing arts and culture to the community. And a big, huge part of that is ensuring that it's actually the community that is deciding how these funds are spent and, and how they're awarded. So it's not just you as community members that are applying for these grants, but it's the community that then turning back around and, and awarding the scores and, and awarding these grants to, to people. So we get together a panel of artists and community members for all these applications. We do have people from each of the different counties. So they, they have some representation of what's going on in those counties. And then, you know, usually I'll try to figure out, okay, oh, we have a ton of say public art applications. I'll make sure we have someone that's, that's versed in public art. So we tr do try to match up different expertise for the panels. And, but I usually try to find someone associated with libraries on the panels as well, because we do get a lot of libraries um, that apply for these. I mentioned this earlier. So each criterion is given zero to five points and the priorities are zero to four points. Uh, so the way it works is that the, the grant panel, so they'll get all the applications in advance electronically. They'll look them over. And then we have the panel. Um, last couple of years, we've had it via Zoom. We'll, pro we'll probably maybe do that, maybe do a hybrid something. I'm not sure yet. Um, but basically the panel is a time when all the panels can gather together and really just speak specifically to these different criterion priorities. Um, it's really kind of a, we go through like maybe anywhere from five to 15 minutes for each application and they go through, okay, this group is, yes, they're quite there. They have great artistic merit. Well, their concert is a little pricey or, oh, so they go through all the criterion priority and they do that for every application. After that process is done, they go home or, or they turn off the computer um, and then they score privately. So they put their scores together privately and then they'll send them in to me and then I will tally all of them. And then we assign applicable dollar amounts based on the funding we have. Um, and then we present it to our art, to the board of directors of the arts council for review. They cannot change any panel decisions. Um, it's just part of the formality of the process and it's just presented to them and they can ask questions. They can make sure, you know, we, we do the process correctly, things like that, but they don't actually come in and say, oh, this library never has the book I want. I did not going to, I mean, I'm not going to fund any of their stuff. Like that's, that's not how it works. So they, it's very um, kind of just um, following the formula of what they need to do to, to review it. In terms of my role at the panel process. So my role is really to, to help facilitate the process. I can answer historical information, you know, whether someone's applied before whether they fulfilled their grant requirements, things like that. Uh, I, you know, help people steer conversations. If, if maybe they're talking about something that is a great, you know, it's a fun conversation, but it ha doesn't have anything to do with the actual criteria, something like that. Um, you know, help, help again, guide the conversations so they stay, stay on, on point in terms of discussing the criteria and the priorities. Um, but I do not offer any opinions. So I don't say that, oh yes, this library does amazing programs. They're really wonderful. I keep that those opinions to myself. Um, it's really important that it's the panelists that are making all these decisions and um, deciding how they want to score and how the funding is going to get uh, given out. So, and one thing I'll say now actually is about our funding. And if you, I think, I'm not sure where everyone's from, um, whether you've all applied before, whether you've thought about applying, uh, please apply. We have a ton of money. So we have about, $305,000 to give out. Just to put that in context, four years ago, 
we were giving out about a hundred thousand dollars and we gave out about 30 ish applications or so. Um, some of this was some increases from COVID relief money, but then the last couple of years, there's basically been these add-ons that the, um, legislature has done to NISCA's budget. So NISCA's had kind of their set budget, but then there's been these add-ons that has really dramatically increased the amount of money that is coming to communities. And it's really been amazing. So last year we gave out $305,000 and we, we awarded 106 grants and, you know, and honestly about people ask how many of those, you know, how many people didn't get money. I think there was only four or five that actually didn't get any money. Vast majority of people got either full or partial funding. Um, so most people got some funding. The reason people don't get funding is maybe they apply to the wrong grant program or just their application is really bare bones and has no information that the panelists can really do any proper kind of scoring. Um, but for the most part, most people are going to get some kind of funding if you answer the questions, if you're meeting the priorities and criteria, things like that. So I definitely encourage you to, to consider applying, um, you know, whether it's this round, next round, sharing this with your colleagues. I, I feel like there's, there's a, a good number of libraries that do apply for this. Um, but I do know that that's not all of them. And I know there's a ton of libraries out there and I know what libraries do in your communities and, and, and it's amazing the programs and, and, and what you are able to do. So, so this money is there. Um, and it's also, I, I, I'm encouraging people to apply too, because, you know, last year we were able to do this. We, uh, Niska basically said, well, how much do you think you can really give out? And the year before that we gave out, I think it was around 230, 240,000, um, which we're like, wow, we could do this. And then last year we're like, well, I think we can do 300 that. And we did it. And so we have it again this year. And so it's just, it's, it's wonderful that, to know that that money can be spent, um, that there is the need and the desire and, and for people to do all these kind of programs, but also just so we can go back and say, yes, state legislature, like this, this need exists in these communities. Um, so really it's, it's, a, um, encourage you to apply this year, uh, in terms of, again, my role, um, I'm happy to look over people's narratives. I do that a lot with a lot of applicants. So if you would like me to look over your, your, what you've put together, I can't actually get into submittable into people's drafts. So what I suggest is either, um, either attaching a um, narrative into a Word document or Google Docs or something where you can share it with me. And, um, and the simplest thing is just to kind of just copy the, the question and then put your answers below it. And then what I'll do is I just kind of look through it. Um, I'll just kind of put comments in red in it. And, and, and again, my perspective is gonna be coming from what are the panelists looking for? Did you answer the questions? This kind of makes sense. Maybe you need more details here. So it's really, I, I do give a lot of constructive feedback, um, really hoping helping hone those applications. Cause if, if this is, whether it's the first time you've applied for a grant or first time writing something, it's a different language than any other kind of language. So it's something, it is a learned skill and, and it's something that people develop. So I, I understand that it's, it is, can, it can be difficult. We try to make it as simple as possible, but um, hopefully, but if you need help or anything with it, please, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. We also have a number of things on our website. Um, in terms of the guidelines, I would recommend you looking through that to make sure you're not requesting something that's ineligible. Um, again, some tips on how to use the application, things like that. And then this is my contact information. So email, definitely, um, phone number. I, we work a lot of, um, remote off outside of our office, but we, our numbers will go through to our cell phone. So please feel free to call. Um, it is a very quick to go to voicemail though, for whatever reason. So leave a voicemail, I'll try to get back to you pretty quickly. Um, but definitely don't hesitate to reach out. And that's whether you're thinking, oh, well, does this, this is what I want to do really apply? Um, would this make sense? Things like that. So I can answer any, any kind of question you have, whether it's just the very, very simple eligibility to, complex. We were thinking of doing this. How should we go about it? Things like that. So I'm very happy to help however people want. And that is my quick presentation. So stop sharing. And is there any specific questions? I'm happy to answer them. And if not, that's great. And you can reach me afterwards, no problem at all. Um, but yeah, libraries are amazing, what everyone's doing. So definitely uh, 
it's a good it's a good amount of money um it's great you know and, and if you you know some some libraries will kind of do they'll fund their whole year of programming sometimes they might just have like one or two workshops they want to get funding for and they'll do that um so it really is a wide variety of of what you want to do and and also the capacity of I mean, I, you know, mac matching, mapping out a whole year worth of stuff can be, you know, can be a little problematic sometimes. So I know I understand that's why some people do that. Um, someone asked about, oh no, I'm getting like an AI message. Hold, okay, here we go. Uh, the reporting process. So the reporting is pretty simple. Um, so we have, so it's also through submittable. There's an online um, kind of form. There's a couple questions, very, very straightforward. Tell us what they worked on the project, what didn't. Um, we I don't require you to submit any receipts. I don't require you to present like a list of all your expenses, things like that. Again, uh, my my view on that is your what people are doing with these grants in terms of the community. The chances of that you're siphoning in this off is very small. There's also a lot of ways I can figure out when people are doing programs, things like that. But you know you should keep your receipts, things like that, for your own records. Um, for whatever, and you know, obviously you, as a nonprofit, you you would need them for your own accounting and things like that. Um, but in terms of what you need to submit to me, I don't require that. Um, but the the I guess I don't know if it's onerous or not. But the big thing that we do have as part of the reporting is that we ask everyone to write letters to your specific um, state senator or assembly person, and that is because again they are they're the ones that are approving this budget. And NISCA itself, because they're a state agency, they cannot advocate for their own budget. But all these people that get grants from NISCA, they can advocate on behalf of NISCA so they can write letters. And it does not have to be anything complex or super long. It it's really can just be a simple, thank you for supporting these programs. And that's it. Um, and we've been told in the past, the, the, the um, legislature, they enjoyed getting these letters. A lot of times because they usually get hate mail so this is a great way that they get happy mail from people um so and again it's also i think important speaking to that amount of money that we get that this is really money that is it's not staying in the city that it's really coming to upstate it's coming to a lot of small rural communities so it's again something it's a good win for for them to be able to talk about and and for you to share what you're doing as well Any other questions for Chris? Yeah, so so that's a very good question. So the way it works um, for any or um, applicant that is on tribal land. So if if it is a tribal organization um, underneath the tribal tribal nation, so whether it's the library or, for instance, on Salamanca, whether it's Seneca Strong or the museum. Um, basically that, that tribal organization has the $5,000 limit, three requests for that particular tribal organization. Um, so the library could apply $5,000 limit. Seneca Strong could apply for $5,000. And I think and everyone would use the Seneca Nation's EIN for their application, um, but it wouldn't, but it wouldn't impact. So only like three people could apply. Um, then also along with that, um, I know that if, I'm not sure exactly where the, the library is located. If it's located on the, the territory, which I know that sometimes I'm speaking more, more for the um, uh, Cataracts territory where it, where it bridges both Erie County and um, Cataraugus County lines. So the, the tribal territory that supersedes those county lines. So it can, it, it could apply, someone that's on um, the Cataraz territory could apply to our grants. They could actually technically also apply up to Erie County for grants as well. Um, so I hope that answers that. But if you have more specific questions, please um, reach out directly to me and I'm happy to, to talk about this as well. Um, and then let's see, we're director, we're we are school district library, therefore not a nonprofit. Did I mention going through um, I guess, could you clarify you're an actual librarian at a school or what, if you wouldn't mind? You can speak to if it's easier. I'm, I don't know. No, there, um, there are some, some libraries in New York state are classified as school district libraries. So, um, it's a public library. 
Um, okay. but yeah, Lindsay, I could talk to you about that uh, afterwards um, about possibly working with STLS to apply for your funding. Okay. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. All right. Yeah. And, and in terms of like who can be the, the nonprofit, like, partner or anybody it's, it can really be anybody in the county um so it doesn't necessarily have to be another library associated entity it's always the easiest usually for people um but but the nice thing is that and i'm not putting stls on the spot um but stls can be a sponsor for any number of applicants so it, it doesn't have to be just strict to like like if you say Lindsay, your library wanted to apply for a full five thousand dollars. You could do that. Some other library could get sponsored and do that. So it so it doesn't impact um, the number of people that that could apply through that way. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. If there are any other questions, feel free to ask now or um, you have Chris's contact info and you can reach out and get a hold of him. Yeah. All right. Well, All great. right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Yep. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.